mission accomplished. <laughs> I knew it took so much. Thank you, Jerry. Can everyone hear me? Do I need to project a little more? Yes. Hair? Is my hair a problem? How's that? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Hi, everyone. Sara Siscali. I work at uh, Ethler & Company, but uh, like many of the folks today, or almost all of them, um, I'm a graduate of Reading's Master's in Typeface Design. It's so lovely to be back here with all my old friends and all kinds of friendly faces. Um, so, uh, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, so I've been working at Ethler & Company for 10 years this year. Uh, which is shocking to me, um, but even more shocking to me is the fact that I've probably spent in aggregate maybe five of those years working on various parts of the typeface copy. <laughs> um, it's probably not the full five, but it's like approaching that. Um, so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, these are the, the latest inhabitants of Gotham here. So, <laughs> probably be nice. I just had to do a little tiny animation. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the most recent uh, massive language expansion that we did for Gotham. Um, it is not massive in the sense of scope, because um, there probably isn't anyone, a single type designer in this room who hasn't tackled a Greek and Cyrillic language extension. Um, it's a small potatoes compared to what most of you do, but um, it's the, the scope of Gotham that actually makes this, um, made this particularly challenging. Also, the year that I was uh, in the master's degree in typeface design here at Reading, I think I was the final year where we were discouraged, actually, from doing a non-Latin script unless it was one that we actually read. So <clears throat> this was actually, <laughs> this was my very first non-Latin uh, effort in typeface design. So talk about jumping in at the deep end. Anyway, um, at this point, I imagine most of the people in this room are familiar with our typeface problem. <clears throat> uh, you might also know that over the years, its original 16 styles, which I should make clear uh, that I was not involved in drawing, uh, they predate my tenure at the studio by about five years, and they were drawn by Tobias and Jonathan along with Jesse Reagan, I believe. Um, anyway, over the years, they've grown to include Gotham Narrow, Gotham Extra Narrow, and Gotham Condensed. <clears throat> and then most recently, as I mentioned, every one of these 66 styles was expanded into a pan-European character set that includes the Greek and the Cyrillic scripts. Um, and it's actually an extended version of the Cyrillic script. Um, but some things you might not know about Gotham have to do with how it's made and what goes into making its various constituent parts, parts work together. Um, Gotham is generally referred to as a geometric typeface, uh, one that's built on the elemental shapes of the circle, square, or triangle. But despite being a geometric sans serif, Gotham is deceptively simple looking. Uh, in fact, nothing about the drawing of its shapes uh, or the morphology of the family is in fact particularly simple at all. Um, as any type designer or any designer at all knows, sometimes a lot of complexity goes into making something look effortless, effortlessly simple. <clears throat> uh, geometry obviously has to give way quite quickly in certain areas of a typeface. Assigning uh, a geometric typeface project to beginning students can be a great exercise as they're forced to grapple with the myriad optical compensations that are required to render letter forms legible and to manage their weight and color. Uh, for instance, uh, the acute joins of the Latin lowercase. Uh, we all know that in order to make a geometric B, D, P, and Q work, uh, a good deal of thinning needs to occur as the bowl approaches the stem or as the ball approaches the stick. Uh, Futura, whose B you see here, is often cited as a prime example of these sorts of necessary adjustments in something that doesn't really look very geometric. Uh, Gotham takes us a step further, I would say. So, for instance, here's what you get when you draw a purely geometric circle, <clears throat> and then place a perfectly circular counter shape inside it to create a perfectly geometric O. And here's Gotham Bowles lowercase O. Um, I think we'd all agree that in text, this appears to be a pretty much a perfect circle uh, and quite monolinear weight. But in fact, when you lay our original perfect circle, which was blue, over Gotham's lowercase o, which was red, you can see pretty substantial differences. Um, Gotham's o is wider, 
and also thinner at the top and bottom than the geometrically perfect one. This is to compensate for the optical illusion that all of the type designers in the room know causes horizontal strokes to appear heavier than vertical ones. Um, but those aren't the only differences. Something that underpins all the weights of Gotham, um, to my great exhaustion, uh, is a consistent, very subtle stroke contrast that is pretty much invisible to the naked eye up to fairly large sizes, unless you flip any of its shapes horizontally or vertically. So that's right reading Gotham, oh, and that's what happens when we flip it around. And this is in all the shapes. Uh, again, in books, I mean, like, you know, the I, the H, not too much, you know, uh, stroke modulation there. But again, this is an optical correction to accommodate the fact that as readers of the Latin script, our eyes are so deeply accustomed to the influence of the broad edge as the instrument that constructed our printed alphabet that letter shapes just look a bit wrong and a bit off balance without it. This hidden stroke contrast is most pronounced in Gotham's light and bold weights, which makes them the most difficult to draw as we try to enable the font to reap the benefits of that stroke contrast while keeping it very much below the level of perceptibility. These shapes are meant to look geometric while not actually being geometric. Uh, but even in Gotham's thinnest weight, the thin, where on average its basic strokes are only something like 20 units thick, uh, and it appears completely monolinear, <clears throat> there's still a tiny bit, one unit, of stroke weight modulation, which again you can see when you flip the shape. It looks just a little bit backwards, but you don't notice it when it's the right way around. Um, and again, the intention isn't for you to see any of this, just for the shapes to look right. Uh, but to get back to other ways in which the family is more complicated than it might appear. Um, am I talking too fast? I'm good? Okay. Let me know if I speed up, because I do that. Okay. Um, so in the beginning there was Gotham One, initially drawn for GQ magazine in the year 2000, and it was good. Thus it begat Gotham Two, and designers everywhere saw that it was good. <laughs> Thus they begat Gotham Condensed, and Jonathan and Tobias saw too that it was good. But then arose the question of what these two might now beget. <laughs> Why, you ask? Shouldn't we be able to just interpolate an intermediate weight or weights in between them and call it a day? Well, no. Because of the kind of dense text setting that the condensed width was intended for, think, you know, big bold newspaper headlines, especially the kind you see in your British tabloids over here, um, the decision was made to give its curved shapes, like the S and the C, in the word stochastic, uh, here, um, stroke endings that were completely vertical instead of those which shear at an angle that's <coughs> perpendicular to the direction of the stroke, as the regular width of Gotham's do on the top over there. So this is the texture that the sheared stroke endings create in the regular widths, um, where it's a lot more varied, and the shapes just have a lot more room to do whatever they need to do. And here's how densely changing them permits the condensed widths to set. You can see it's a huge difference. So anyway, to answer the question of what might lie between these two extremes, the regular width on the left and the condensed width on the right, we have to look at these two parts of the family a little more close up. <clears throat> so this is where we kind of delve into the like micro world of Gotham. Um, so here's what happens when you create a simple interpolation between the two extremes. <clears throat> at the width that we call now the extra narrow. Uh, it feels like just that, a half measure. It's neither here nor there, I find. So you have the stroke ending just kind of starts to average towards vertical, but it's neither what I would call ductile or vertical. <clears throat> so we force it to pick a side uh, and create new stroke endings to make it harmonize more decisively with the regular widths, because we have a feeling we're going to want to create another interpolation in between these two. So uh, we're kind of looking forward a little bit with that decision. Um, here's the pure interpolation, the bold uppercase C. We were looking at the ultra weight before. Um, and there's the corrected version. And you can see it's not just the stroke endings that change. You know, in a shape of that width, changing the nature of the stroke endings really changes the structure of the entire curve, except for the, the very extreme opposite side. So, um, and again, the implicit stress that I mentioned that underlies this entire design makes these stroke ending adjustments a lot trickier than they look because there's no cutting and pasting to be done. Each really has to do its own thing just to look right. They are not mirror images of each other anywhere, even though they might look like they are. So again, you can see if we just, I just took those C's and flipped them vertically, and you know, no single one of them is the same top to bottom. Even, even in that con condensed extreme where it really looks like it's just a mirror image, there are 
are pretty substantial. Well, to type designers, substantial differences. Type designers have a totally different scale of perception, of course, than everybody else. <coughs> Uh, these changes also create issues with spacing and kerning, as you can see how um, the relationship between this interpolated S and T changes when the S's stroke endings change. So just multiply that by all the lists in the type base that require this treatment, and that's a whole lot of recurring and, and spacing to be done. Um, another area in which the regular width and condensed Gotham's differ is in counter shapes, like those of the six and nine. In the regular width, they're round like you see on the left. Whereas in the condensed, they're sharp. And again, I had nothing to do with drawing this condensed, <laughs> so I was just dealing with the aftermath. So I look at these things and I'm like, why? Um, I'm kidding. I think, they, I, think they're, I think they're all to very good effect, but I came into this project at the point of, let's see, what did, what did I do? I think I created all the numeric glyphs for Gotham 1 and 2. Then I came in and worked with uh, Tobias and Jonathan on this whole width expansion. So this is like sort of phase two in my lengthy relationship, my long-term relationship with Gotham. Um, so we've got this issue, uh, creating again a kind of indecisive interpolation, which also has kind of a funny weight jump. I don't know if you can see this uh, here. Again, the scale of things that would, you know, to which a type designer sees a cataclysm when most people wouldn't even notice. <laughs> um, this cannot stand. So, uh, of course, we fix it and make it more, again, like the regular width Gotham's. Um, and some other things, uh, like the Y, which takes a completely different shape. Here's the raw interpolation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why we couldn't just use that. Uh, here's our corrected version. Um, so, that's the main thrust of the sort of morphology changes that happen in the extra narrows. Um, but Another thing that uh, happens here is that to compensate for the profound change in the proportions of the uppercase between the two extremes, you probably noticed that um, the capitals of regular with Gotham are very like wide and chunky um, compared to the lowercase, whereas in the condensed, everything becomes much more monolithic, um, just of necessity, um, and just because that's the, the way you treat a condensed font, everything becomes a lot more regularized. Um, we wound up interpolating the uppercase and lowercase glyphs at slightly different values so that the uppercase gets a little stronger in the extra narrows, again, favoring them in the direction of what happens in the regular width columns. Um, so, again, this is the raw interpolation. Um, this is the corrected version where the lowercase is adjusted to be a little narrower. Um, so, that's what happens when you lay them on top of each other. It's, you know, small difference. Um, it kind of just looks like trapping, but it's not. Um, and then, because of the narrow or lower case, we also felt that it needed a slightly denser fit. So we tightened up the spacing a bit to turn it into this. So this is the final uh, result in the extra narrows. Um, and again, overlaid the kind of aggregate difference is that. Um, and I kept the line breaks the same here just to be able to compare them directly. So this doesn't seem like so much, but when you multiply it by the eight masters that it's executed on, suddenly it looks like a bit more of a project. Um, and that's kind of the theme here. So we get the first four Roman weights done. There are four masters in each width of Gotham. Uh, the thin, the light, the bold, and the ultra. Um, so we get the, the four Romans done. I'm getting into the swing of it. I'm thinking, hey, this is getting easier. I totally got the hang of this. Uh, and then we started the same process with the italics. Um, and to quickly realize that these different interpolation percentages that I just showed you, which otherwise I don't know that I really would have gone into, because uh, it's sort of like fa fairly automatic, that part of the process. But we realized that these different interpolation percentages actually create conflicting slope angles, both among the different weights, because of course we couldn't use the same value for every single weight, because <laughs> why would we do that? Um, but also between the caps and the lowercase uh, within one weight, as you can see here. So then we had to manually correct all of those. Anyway, in the end, after a lot more work than we bargained for, we got our hard one got the extra narrows. Yay! Uh, from which we were then able to create simple, unadjusted interpolations for the narrow weight. 
but you're all really relieved to hear that. <laughs> and I can tell you, I've never been happier to interpolate a new width of a font than I was when I finally saw these. Um, so in the end, this is what the full family looks like. Uh, Latin at the top, and then Greek in the middle. It's just totally fading, I can see on the projector. Oh well, there are thin weights up at the top of each of these. Um, and then the Cyrillic at the bottom. Um, and these are transliterated, like Google transliterated, or no, some website I found, not Google, uh, transliterated uh, reflections of the style names. So they might make no sense to any Greek or Cyrillic readers in the audience. Jerry, is it totally? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> What's that? Yeah. Makes no sense, yeah. It's transliterated, literally, but okay. anyway. Um, I just thought I'd have a little bit of fun with something that basically almost no one can see. Um, so the styles highlighted in red are the ones which are drawn from scratch. Um, so if we just look at the Latin at the top, which really represents, oh, gosh, yeah, you really can't see those thin weights. Anyway, um, it looks great on my screen. Uh, basically, just looking at, across one uh, section of it, which really represents one um, uh, sort of chunk of the family. It's actually, it's 16 initial masters. So there's four masters in each width for the Romans, four in each width for the italics, in the normal width and the condensed. Um, many designers might make only two masters for a weight range like this, but that's just kind of how we roll at the Templar Company. Um, and then there's the eight heavily edited extra narrow submasters we just talked about. So altogether, that's essentially <clears throat> 24 masters in the Gotham family, all of which we then decided to expand into the Greek and Cyrillic scripts. Um, and we chose to work with an extended Cyrillic character set, which effectively causes it to double in size um, and in difficulty if you take a look at some of the shapes down there. Um, of course, not that this is anything compared with the kinds of scripts that a lot of people in this audience are designing, but for someone who had just designed only Latin up to this point, I was a little bit like, whoa. Okay, so just to give you a snapshot of what working on a family with this many masters involves, um, so our you know, this is also just kind of how we roll uh, at our company. Um, our Greek and extended Cyrillic kerning proofs um, alone were 150 pages per pass. So this is only for the Greek and Cyrillic language extension. Each pass at kerning, and for each master we would have minimum, I would say, three passes at kerning, um, is 150 pages. So you multiply that by two sets of prints, um, I completely neglected to say, I make, I'm making it sound like I did this single-handedly, totally didn't. Um, this Greek and Cyrillic language extension was a, very much a team effort. It was uh, in large part drawn by Malou Garlon, who worked with us as a freelancer. Uh, the basic um, kind of template for the character shapes uh, was worked out by Tobias Fair Jones in consultation with Jerry for the Greek, and Maxim Zhukov and Ilya Ruderman for the Cyrillic. Um, and then I was the kind of editor in the middle of all that and wound up, I don't know, drawing and recurring and whatever, anything that needed extra attention um, and managed the whole process. And then I also did all the extra narrows. Um, we did those in-house. So the um, point is, one set of prints each for the designer and the editor, because we were working transatlantic, uh, apparently approximately three rounds per master, uh, equals approximately 44 reams of tabloid-sized paper, or a3 in uh, European France, or a stack over seven feet high. Um, for the older members of the audience, that's as tall as uh, Karim Abdul-Jabbar, who is seven foot two. <clears throat> and just for context, that's how tall Karim Abdul-Jabbar is. <laughs> Probably not as tall as Karim. This is Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I found a picture of the two of them together, just for scale. Um, but I digress. So, um, Let's just zoom in before I get into some of the Cyrillic stuff, uh, written Cyrillic stuff. We can just zoom in and take a look at some of the kinds of uh, sort of micro trickery that takes place outside of the basic stuff we've been looking at so far. Um, when you're dealing with extreme weights or width, or in this case both, all kinds of shapes need special attention. Um, take the lowercase o slash, for instance, in Gotham Condensed Ultra, which is what we're looking at here. Um, it's just the lowercase o with a slash through it, right? Of course it isn't. Um, here's lowercase o. Uh, so what we do is we would start out by scaling, start out by scaling up the counter uh, to create more room inside the shape. 
um, and to take weight out of the main shape, as well as taking some weight out, you might not be able to see this, but from the top right and lower left, to anticipate where that cross stroke is going to go through, um, so that it looks like this. Um, so now we just have the slash, right? Of course not. Uh, because a similar effect occurs inside the counter of an O slash to that in the crossing of the two diagonals of an X, um, shapes that should appear continuous uh, as continuous diagonals seem to bend as they cross each other, especially at smaller sizes um, and where there's more weight in play, uh, we compensate by pulling the diagonals apart slightly where they meet. In this case, we basically rotate the center diagonal counterclockwise to compensate for the impression of horizontality that it creates as it crosses the counter shape. And of course, we take some weight out of it too, uh, so that we wind up with something that in extreme cases actually looks like this. Um, and it looks like a logo for a superhero or something. I think you can tell me. It bet some typographic superhero that can have this on his jersey, or her jersey. Uh, so now we're done. Uh, here's what it looked like before, and that's the after. And if you don't see any improvement, then I can start working shorter days. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so once we get into the much more varied and complex shapes of the Greek and Cyrillic scripts, especially the extended Cyrillic, all kinds of other factors come into play, um, such as the shapes um, that seem like they could just be repurposed from the Latin, as the Greek kappa is from the Latin K, uh, which with its ascender conveniently just lowered to the X height, not drawing that shape. Um, but in making the Cyrillic Ka and its related J, this stacked form joining is not appropriate, so these shapes are made in this case with a horizontal segment connecting the diagonals to the vertical, uh, which of course all starts to go to hell as weight creeps in. As you can see in the bold, uh, in the third line, that flat segment has gotten pretty tiny, um, and then by the last line, uh, by the time we get to the ultra weight, it's been completely swallowed up. <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is just the four masters that we're actually drawing in, by the way. I'm leaving out all the, all the interpolations. Um, so, and this is the widest width of Gotham. Um, and you also notice that the X height increases a lot as the weight uh, increases. You can see how much shorter the ascender is there. It's not because the ascender got shorter, it's because the X height gets so much taller. Um, so anyway, it's even worse in the condensed ultra, where these shapes basically have slits for counters in the heaviest weight. <clears throat> There's definitely no room for a horizontal segment there. Um, but of course, you might recall from earlier that these weights I'm showing you are all masters, which means we have to be able to interpolate between them. Um, so we construct them in a way that looks unnecessarily fussy in the thin weight. Can you guys actually see those strokes? Yeah. Um, but which enables us to hide a horizontal segment inside the vertical stroke of the ultra of the exact right weight and length um, so that it interpolates perfectly um, as it just barely starts to appear in the black. Uh, which is the intermediate weight between the ultra and the bold. Mind you, in this width, uh, it's almost still just like an e trap at this point, but this has to work across you know, the whole giant range that we've looked at already. Um, but of course, there's not just Russian to think about. For some real fun, we also get to draw the pre-1991 Azari column with vertical stroke, um, which you see here on the right. Um, or, well, yeah, it's still on the right there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> right, left, these are concepts, I'm still having trouble mastering. Um, so, uh, like everything, you can see this gets more and more challenging as the weight increases. Um, trying to still make the shape look like a cop and still have it carry as much weight as it needs to without getting too freakishly wide. Um, yet now we really have to get that horizontal, horizontal segment in there in order for this shape not to wind up just looking like a spiky blob or half an asterisk or something. Um, and of course this only gets more difficult as the width starts to narrow, so by the time you get to the condensed ultra, the cough part of the shape has had to undergo quite a transformation um, from our normal condensed ultra cough. Uh, its two halves get pulled apart from each other, both use many units of weight, sorry, lose many units of weight, um, and then the joining point of the diagonals has to push out right, making its sideways kind of chevron shape more vertical to make room for all that stuff we have to jam into the middle of it, um, all while still trying to look as much like its Russian counterpart as possible. Uh, it's constructed like this, <laughs> believe it or not, so we can control all of its parts independently throughout the whole weight and width range. In this master, the condensed ultra, uh, you might be able to see we even resorted to slightly pinching in the center of the vertical stroke to pull yet more weight out of it wherever we could without being too obvious. But lest I make you think the heavyweights and condensed widths are the only ones that require these kinds of adjustments, 
Uh, the thinnest and widest variant changes a lot in this form as well. Uh, its weight may not change, but its width and the angles of its diagonal strokes change appreciably in order to provide more substantial horizontal for the vertical stroke to bisect without, again, creating a conspicuous dark spot uh, in text. So, anyway, <clears throat> another area where Gotham's like one two punch of low contrast plus heavy weight starts to require some extreme measures is in the upper horizontal strokes of the Cyrillic Day, the Serbian Bay, and the Greek Delta. Uh, which you see in the sequence there. Um, as they get heavier, these wind up reaching all the way down the horizontals, all the way almost down to the X height, thus requiring their bowls to shrink considerably below the X height uh, to accommodate this, while still maintaining the correct proportions and appearance of weight, much like the Latin lowercase g does above the baseline. Um, you can also see on the right, indicated by the dotted yellow lines, uh, that the horizontal toss stroke of the Greek sigma starts to become a much more intrusive feature um, as stroke weight increases. But I think it just makes it pretty. A uh, similar phenomenon takes place in these extended Cyrillic cover case shapes. The, I think several of which are from Serbian, which is a, a, a language that like pokes lots of holes in words. Um, so the dominant arch and bowl shapes of the Serbian uh, Che and J, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these things correctly, um, and then the pre-1917 Russian yacht um, wind up having to shrink to make way for their upper horizontal strokes as the weight increases. Um, and you can see how the position of the top of those changes in relation to the, the uh, horizontal of the H. Um, and for comparison, you can see the, the, uh, the Che here and how different those become. And, also the P on the, or the external card on the right. Um, <clears throat> and those, of course, don't require these adjustments, so you can see just how much shorter those dominant shapes have to get. Um, another issue that becomes a new challenge in this pan-European character set is spacing. The fit of Gotham changes in pretty extreme ways throughout its range. Um, as you'd expect, lighter weights and wider widths are more loosely spaced in response to their wider counter shapes. And then, of course, spacing tightens up considerably as counter shapes get narrower, both due to weight increasing and width decreasing. But also, Gotham's extreme weights and widths <clears throat> are optimized more, uh, slightly more for display settings than for text. So spacing and kerning um, and accommodating different kinds of width collisions or gaps, which are more prevalent in Cyrillic and Greek settings than Latin, require very different approaches from one part of the family to another. Uh, one of the most challenging groups of shapes in this regard are the Cyrillic and extended Cyrillic descending characters that you see here. I should start pointing in this direction just for a variety, but you know I need my right hand for the arrow key. Um, in lightweights, you can see their descenders function almost like an afterthought, but in heavyweights, they're a whole other story. Um, like the upper horizontal stroke of the Greek sigma that we looked at a few minutes ago, these right side descenders become a major anatomical feature, um, but in this case, a feature with serious implications for spacing and kerning, as you can see, all these things that seem like they should be sort of symmetrical triplets suddenly start to kind of come apart. Um, and I'm showing you the lowercase versions here, as you can imagine these get even more prominent and disruptive in the lowercase, um, sorry, uppercase. Um, and in fact, because we organize our printing proofs by shape type, we actually wound up having to create a separate set of proofs that were organized differently just for the ultra weights in this family. Um, and all I can say is thank goodness for printing, because without it, these strings get pretty unsightly and heavy weights. Um, not that they're much to look at now, but we do the best we can with what we have. Um, just a, the descenders are important semantic parts of these characters, so they have to be given enough prominence and function, even if that means they get a bit disruptive at times. Um, so uh, the Greek lowercase poses its own special challenges for spacing and evenness of color, especially in the heavier uh, and more condensed weights with their very dense fit. You can see the counter shapes of the zeta, the c, and the final sigma look nice and similar to the other counter shapes in the lighter weights in the first two rows, but in that bottom row, things really start to kind of change a lot. Um, in order for these open-sided shapes to have room to do their thing, they wind up having much larger counter shapes relative to the tiny little slits inside most of the rest of the letter shapes, especially compared with the Latin, where the lowercase c is the only one that even comes close. Um, and the way we deal with this is just to make them relatively narrower as their weight increases and their width decreases relative to the rest of the characters. Uh, which you can see here in the relationship between the zeta and the Latin n. Uh, in the thin and condensed thin, their widths are nearly identical, 
Uh, but in the ultra-condensed, the zeta has to diverge and become noticeably narrow in order not to poke distractingly cavernous holes in words. Um, another interesting shape to work with across this kind of range, both for drawing and spacing in the view, which as you can see in a wide light way, has a middle curved segment that's basically identical to the lowercase u, but by the time we get to the heavyweights, again, all bets are off, and that curved segment just has to do what it has to uh, to make room for everything that has to happen along the baseline of this shape. So here's what our thin view looks like as an outline, which seems like its construction, again, is unnecessarily complicated. Um, in fact, you can't see all of the seemingly superfluous nodes that are on this shape in uh, Robofont. Um, but that's because it has to interpolate the shapes that do this. Um, you can see we've had to push both of the verticals outward at the bottom um, and add a big ink trap in order to create room for that curved segment to even be visible. And that segment itself has had to really shrink down to a much smaller version of itself in order to fit in. Um, and then lastly, there's this group of kind of mirrored shapes, most of which are Cyrillic, but there's the Greek epsilon representing in there too, which theoretically can just flip horizontally to become the Cyrillic Z, right? Except, of course, it can't. Um, and I'm sure anyone who's done a Greek and Cyrillic knows this. Um, to be, to, to different degrees, all of these shapes have to be drawn differently in order to make them look the same. And again, it's, it's Gotham's uh, ostensible geometricness that makes this particularly difficult drawing because we have to hide all that. It becomes sleight of hand. Um, so one example is this, the, um, the Bulgarian gay, um, which is shaped like a backwards Latin S. Um, this is our Latin S. This is what it looks like when you flip it horizontally. Not so nice. So we drew something that looked like this, which is a lot more similar, but actually very different. Um, this one always kind of trips me up. I feel like the R, it looks like it was almost drawn by an engineer, like with a compass and ruler. And um, I was amazed, even when you flip this, you can see the stress in it. It looks backwards. Um, so to make the Cyrillic Ya, which is like a reverse version of the Latin R's, which we all know, um, it does take some adjustments. The color change here makes those adjustments less obvious. But anyway, uh, that's what they look like facing each other. Um, and it's pretty subtle, but uh, we take a bunch of weight out of the top left there and shift the, the uh, angle of the leg a bit. And there's also a little weight change in there. So, yeah, even the R. Anyway, all of this to say, sorry I'm running a little bit long, um, so nobody gets to ask any questions. Um, this is what we wound up with. This is the bold weight of the normal width of Gotham, Gotham Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic. And I find when I set it like this, I have a pretty, it takes me a minute to pick out which script is which, and that was exactly what all this work was aiming towards. So we've got the, we've got Latin, and then some Cyrillic, and then some more Latin, and then some Greek. Um, this is them split up, just so you can see them more clearly. And then we can just take a little, a quick zip diagonally across the family, just to show you how it all worked out. And then, I didn't show you the italics because morphologically, they're, they're not sloped Romans. They took a hell of a lot of work to make look right, but morphologically, they're sloped Romans. We can uh, change the basic shapes of the, of the Romans. So, I thought, this talk was already long enough. But anyway, these are the italics. Again, this is just a selection zipping across. Oh, I was gonna tell you guys that <laughs> the little the little happy faces and the little little characters at the beginning, the new the new uh, residents of Gotham, um, where they came from. I wasn't just being silly, although I was being silly. Um, but so we're, Malou and I were working together by PDF, and I would mark up his PDFs using these stamps that Tobias and I had um, ginned up in Acrobat um, for the art style of markup um, for art changes. So Malou and I both kept seeing these funny shapes in, in my markups. <laughs> and sometimes I wouldn't notice them because it was all fast and furious, and I would just slap it together and send it. And, uh, and in one case, he <laughs> sent me an email that uh, introduced me to Mr. Babin, who he saw in a uh, uh, a version of the uh, chain with vertical stroke, which is cropped in. Um, and then we started just seeing them everywhere. You can see a little bit of this. Anyway, there's two nodes that need to move together. Um, in the, the, the Che and the J, these are like little camels or something, I'm not sure. 
Uh, this is my favorite, actually, because it's wearing earrings. It's really fancy. Um, anyway, so we all just want to say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.